Okay, welcome back. In this video, we'll go over chapter number 11, the senses, the sights, and sounds. All, right, all of the sensory input that you receive from the external world has to be interpreted by the brain in order for you to appreciate it and understand it. So anything that you see, anything that you hear, uh, smell and taste and touch, all that is sensory information that your brain has to interpret for you. Now your senses are also uh, protective in nature, so you're able to quickly interpret information and adapt or interact accordingly. Seeing a car coming, speeding towards you, you'll know to get out of the way. Uh, learning objectives for this chapter, be able to differentiate between general and special senses. Right, describe the internal and external anatomy and functions of the eye and ear. Uh, discuss the process involved with the senses of taste and smell and touch. Be able to contrast the types of pain and the pain response. And explain several common disorders of the ears, eyes, and senses. Uh, the different senses. Now, our senses allows us uh, to experience all aspects of our, of our journey in life. Allowing us to see and hear and smell and taste and feel uh, the world around us. The senses enable us to monitor and detect uh, changes in our environment. This thing is information to our brain uh, via the sensory neurons or the afferent neurons. And the brain will interpret that information and will make appropriate uh, motor responses through motor neurons or efferent neurons. All right, the senses of sight and hearing and balance, uh, sound and taste and smell are what's known as special senses. That's because their receptors are all contained all within the head. The other senses are known as general senses being able to uh, feel heat, cold, pain, nausea, hunger, thirst, and pressure of touch because those receptors are th throughout the entire body. So basically anything that you can touch is a general sense because those receptors are throughout or everywhere throughout the body. And the other senses, seeing, hearing, taste, and smell are all confined to just your head. That's why they're special senses. The cutaneous senses include, include receptors for touch and heat and cold and pain because cutaneous is a reference to skin so these are the receptors found within your skin. Uh, the visceral senses include uh, nausea and hunger, uh, thirst and the need to uh, urinate and also defecate. Now one controversial sense is the extrasensory perception, ESP, meaning outside the normal uh, perception of, of sensory information. There is debate on whether or not this is really a sense or not. Right, first, we'll go into the sense of sight. Now, your eye has a lot of similarities to that of a camera. And if a light, light rays entering uh, from an image uh, that you're looking at will pass through the pupil, then through your lens, and then focus on the retina. Now, the iris is what allows the right amount of light to enter the eye for proper focusing. The iris is also the colored part of the eye. So when you say you have green eyes or brown eyes or blue eyes, you're talking about the iris specifically. Right, the external structures of the eye, uh, the lacrimal glands or will help secrete tears to help keep the eye clean. Uh, the orbit or the orbital cavity is the cone-shaped cavity formed in the skull that houses the, the eyeball itself. Uh, this cavity is padded with uh, fatty tissue to prevent injury occurring to the eyeball. There are six short muscles that connect the eyeball to the orbit and these will allow for uh, rotary movement so you can see in all directions. Uh, the eyelids, of course, will close over the eye to protect it from uh, very intense light or foreign particles or any kind of impact injury. Uh, your eyelashes, uh, they're in the eyelid and help to protect uh, larger particles from entering the eye. Also within the eyelid, you'll find uh, sebaceous glands that help secrete uh, sebum, which keep the eyelids uh, soft and pliable and uh, remain slightly sticky to trap uh, particles from entering the eye. The conjunctiva is a membrane over the surface of the eyeball that acts as a protective covering for exposed surfaces. This is what gets infected when you get pink eye. It's also called conjunctivitis. This is the actual structure that gets uh, infected. Uh, the lacrimal apparatus is what produces and stores tears. It contains the lacrimal glands and the corresponding ducts that go along with it. And the lacrimal gland will produce tears and it will spread them by blinking for cleaning and for lubrication of the eyeball. And also known as, or also works as an antiseptic. All right, here's a generic illustration of the external and the lacrimal structures of the eye. They have the lacrimal sac in here, the eyeball itself, 
the white part that you see is the uh, the sclera. Of course, the eyelid here, the eyelashes. See the iris here, the color part of the eye, the light, the site where light enters the eye, uh, the pupil right here. All right, now I'll move uh, more internally, so the internal parts of the eye. The globe-shaped eyeball is the organ of vision. It has uh, two separate chambers inside it. And they're called. Uh, they're filled with uh, different humors or fluids. When you talk about anatomy, the term humor is a reference to fluid, not humor like haha, -ha, funny. You have the uh, aqueous humor and the vitreous humor. The aqueous humor is what's found in the anterior chamber or the front part of the eyeball and will help bathe the iris and the pupil and the lens. Uh, the vitreous humor is a clear jelly-like fluid that will occupy the entire eye cavity just behind the lens. Uh, the sclera this is the outermost region of the eyeball itself, the white part of the eyeball. Very tough, very uh, fibrous tissue as a protective shield. Also where muscles attach to the eyeball itself, so they're able to move the eyeball. And within the sclera, you find uh, the cornea, which is a transparent area that allows light to pass through and bulges out in the front. And the reason why it, is, it bulges out in the front so it's able to bend light to focus it directly toward the retina. Another eye layer, uh, the choroid, sometimes called the choroid coat. A very pigmented, very uh, vascularized region of the eye that helps provide nourishment to the eye. This is the middle layer. In here you'll find the iris and the pupil. And like we mentioned before, it's the actual colored part of the eyeball. And the iris is a sphincter that will control the opening where light passes into the eye. So the iris will control how large or how small the, the pupil is. In very low light, the sphincter will relax, allowing the pupil, pupil to dilate so more light can enter. Then whenever you go to an optometrist, there, this is the reason why your pupils are dilated, so they can see see with more detail inside your eyeball. See, uh, the retina is the innermost layer of the eye itself, but will contain the nerve endings that uh, receive and interpret uh, rays of light, where you'll find the, uh, the lens itself located behind the iris, behind the pupil. It's uh, elastic and uh, disc-shaped. Uh, biconvex uh, crystal stru structure. It looks like the lens of a pair of eyeglasses in a way. After light enters the eye, it will pass through uh, multiple structures before it gets to the retina. It will pass through the uh, conjunctival membrane, uh, the cornea, the aqueous humor, the pupil, the lens, vitreous humor, and it's all focused on the retina. Here are the internal structures of the eye. So you have uh, the eyelids here, lower lid, upper eyelid, eyelashes here. Light would enter through here, through the pupil, and its outermost bulge here is the cornea. So light would go through the pupil, which is controlled by the iris, uh, to go through the lens. And the first anterior part of the eyeball, you'll find the uh, aqueous humor, and from the lens all the way to the back, you'll have the vitreous humor. So light will go through here, through here and is focused on the retina in the very, very back. And the retina is continuous with the optic nerve, which will go on to the brain. And so for the layers, the white part on this image is like it is in real life, the white part of the eyeball, the sclera, the avascular layer. Uh, choroid, this reddish color here. And the innermost lining, the retina. All right, here's a good uh, summary of uh, uh, the structure of the eye and then also its function all in one uh, one table anything from the uh, the orbit and the cavity itself down to the uh, the lens all right next talk about uh, a pathology connection uh, some common disorders of the eye uh, the first one is a sty this is an abscess that forms at the the base of an eyelash due to an infection an infection of the uh, sebaceous gland is usually a uh, bacterial infection uh, can become uh, very swollen very red very painful and it resembles uh, an acne pimple, but on your eye. Conjunctivitis, also known as pink eye. Uh, inflammation of the conjunctiva, the membrane that lines the eye itself. And it's called pink eye because it actually gives your eye the, the, a reddish color. So it's pretty straightforward why it's called pink eye. Uh, some possible causes of uh, conjunctivitis. Uh, irritants, like fumes or onions, for example. Uh, could be various pathogens, like viruses or bacteria such as uh, Staphylococcus aureus, uh, or an acute infection, a chlamydia, uh, trochomatis, also be a 
will tend to be a long-term infection or a chronic infection. Uh, see, viral and bacterial forms of conjunctivitis are very highly contagious. All right, moving on to the next one, a cataract. This is a clouding of the lens as the possible causes. It could be due to congenital defects or trauma or aging. It's not uncommon for as we get older to naturally develop more cataracts on the lens. And also increased exposure to sunlight can speed up the development of cataracts. Now if these are left untreated, the entire lens will become completely clouded over and you will become blind. Some typical treatments for uh, cataracts is uh, surgery. And this is actually one of the earliest recorded known surgeries going all the way back to ancient Greece. Uh, glaucoma is where you have an increased pressure in the fluid of the eye. And when this happens, the pressure will cause a, a, a squeezing on the optic nerve itself. So the optic nerve function is disrupted. The vision will gradually uh, deteriorate because of this. Peripheral vision gets affected first. So the vision off to the sides of your head. Then eventually you'll, you'll get uh, more and more tunnel vision. And then left untreated, it will get smaller and smaller and smaller until you are eventually blind. Glaucoma will occur in about 20% of adults that are age 40 or older. It also accounts for roughly 15% of all blindness in America. Uh, very easy to diagnose. And some common treatments are surgery and some medication. Uh, next one, macular degeneration. This is a condition that will cause the loss of central vision. Your peripheral vision is fine, but the central vision, what you see directly in front of you, gets affected. There are two forms of macular degeneration, or MD. You have atrophic, or dry, which has no cure, or hemorrhagic, or exudative, which can improve slightly with argon laser therapy. Retinopathy. This is irreversible damage to the retina. This can be caused by uh, systemic diseases, like hypertension or diabetes, and this can result in either impairment of your vision or in, com in the complete blindness. But once you have this damage to the retina, you can't undo it. Once it's done, it's done. Uh, the effects that impair vision, uh, farsightedness or uh, hyperopia. This is where the eye can't focus properly on nearby objects. So you are able to see things far away, but not things up close. Things up close are going to be blurry, but things far away are fine. So you're you're able to sight things that are far away. That's why it's far sightedness. And the way to correct that is wearing glasses that have a convex lens to help uh, refocus the light on the retina. Okay, another defect, uh, presbyopia. This is farsightedness that will occur uh, with age, usually between the ages of 40 and 45. The lens itself will become uh, stiff and kind of yellowish in color. So it becomes more sensitive to glare that can impair uh, nighttime driving. You'll see halos around uh, any, any type of light, like a street light or headlights on a car. So it impairs your ability to see clearly at night. And the way to uh, treat this would be using uh, corrective lenses like bifocals. Another common uh, defect, uh, myopia or nearsightedness. This is where you're able to see things up close clearly, but not things that are far away. So you're able to sight things that are near to you. That's why it's called nearsightedness. And the way you correct this is to wear glasses that have a concave lens that will help focus the light on the retina. Okay, another defect that impairs vision, uh, amblyopia or lazy eye often occurs in childhood. This will cause poor vision in the one eye because one eye will work harder than the other. Diplopia is where the brain will perceive two separate images. So you are basically basically having double vision. This can be a result of monocular disease. A good way to treat this would be uh, corrective lenses or surgery or even an eye patch. Another defect, uh, strabismus. We have one eye that's a misalign due to the the inability of the muscles to coordinate movement with the other eye. And children are usually affected by this due to a congenital defect. Nyctalopia is a degeneration of the retina itself. And have difficulty seeing in uh, dim light or at, at night time. Often caused by deficiency in vitamin A. And vitamin A is needed to make uh, the photopigments in the rod cells which are found within the, within the retina. Uh, some corrective vision options, of course eyeglasses are, are common, or contact lenses, uh, RK surgery, radial keratotomy, yeah. and uh, LASIK surgery. Are right, some other defects that impair vision, uh, red-green color blindness. 
If you have this, you have the inability to distinguish between the colors red and green. And this is due to a genetic defect on the, one of your X chromosomes, which causes more men to get this uh, than women. It's passed on from mom to the sons. And it's diagnosed by using uh, colored figures that require patients to distinguish between the various colors. Okay. Here's a comparison of nearsightedness and farsightedness. You have the normal eye here. And in each of these examples, you're looking at a, a cup of coffee. So what should happen in the normal eye, when you're looking at an image, the light that goes through your eye is focused directly on the retina. If you are myopic or nearsighted, the image gets focused just in front of the retina. So for things that are cl close up to you, you see them fine, but the further the object is away, the more and more blurry it becomes because it's focusing too far in front of the retina. Now the opposite of that will be true for farsightedness. You have the image that's being focused behind the retina. So the further away it is, the more clear it is to you, but the more close up it is, it becomes more blurry because it can't focus on the retina. It's going beyond the retina. All right, and here's a, a standard color chart that includes red and green circles. And people who are colorblind are not able to see the number that's embedded in the green circles in this, in this figure. Are using eyes to diagnose uh, some non-visual diseases is able to or you're able to help diagnose uh, jaundice by looking at the uh, conjunctiva which will indicate uh, liver disease the conjunctiva will become uh, yellow which is a good indicator of jaundice uh, some neurological assessments called perla now, pupils equal reactive delight and accommodation are used to uh, assess brain injury that's why uh, doctors will flash a light into your eye to see if your pupils are responding or not. If they aren't responding, that means there's some neurological damage there. Uh, rapid eye movement, or REM, is a, a stage of sleep that can be measured in uh, sleep studies to help diagnose some sleep disorders. All right, now we'll move on to the sense of hearing. Now the ear is responsible not only for hearing, but also for maintaining equilibrium, or a sense of balance. And we hear uh, by perceiving uh, sound vibrations usually in the air and those are translated into interpretable sound due to the vestibulocochlear nerve in the brain. Right, the ear has uh, three main divisions uh, external, middle, and the inner ear. Here are examples of, of each. The external ear is the actual part that we see you know, the, the ear itself, the, the pinna itself, or the oracle, and all the way up into the eardrum of the tympanic membrane. The middle ear is where you find the uh, the smallest bones of the body, the ossicles, then the inner ear, the actual structures of balance. All right, the external ear is the outer projection, the part that we see, often called the, the penna or the oracle. It also includes the, the, ex, or the, the canal that leads to the middle ear, often called the auditory canal, or also called the external acoustic meatus. This canal will make uh, cerumen, or earwax, and secreted by the ceruminous glands to help lubricate and to protect the ear. At the end of this canal is where you find the uh, the eardrum or the tympanic membrane, and it's called that because it looks like a a type of drum called a tympani, and this is where the external ear ends. The middle ear or the tympanic cavity is where you'll find the ossicles, the three smallest bones of the body. And these ossicles are joined so they can amplify the sound waves that hit the tympanic membrane, and by amplifying the sound waves, you can transmit that energy to fluid within the inner ear or the bones of the ear are named for their shape, their Latin name, and also their more common name. Uh, the first one is the hammer, also known as the malleus. This is attached directly to the, the eardrum. Then you have the anvil, or incus, which is attached directly to the, the hammer itself. Then you have uh, the stirrup, or the stapes, which connects to the a membrane called the oval window. This will begin the inner ear. Now, these ossicles help amplify the sound that we hear over 20 times the original level. Right, uh, the eustachian tubes or auditory tubes are what allow for air pressure on either side of the eardrum to be equalized. Uh, these tubes will connect the nose and the throat to the middle ear. Uh, this equalizing of the pressure allows the eardrum to freely, or freely vibrate with incoming sound waves. If you've ever been on an airplane or, or high up in a, in a high elevation like in the mountains and you feel like your head is in a bottom of a barrel or feel like you're in a drum, it's because of the pressure is not equal on either side because of these eustachian tubes are blocked. That's why people are encouraged to you know, chew gum or 
something to help move their jaw to help kind of free up some of this pressure. So when you're popping your ears, what you're really doing is equalizing the pressure of the eustachian tubes. All right, the oval window is the portal into the beginning of the inner ear. Uh, the inner ear has three separate hollow bony spaces that form a labyrinth or a maze. So this area can be called the bony labyrinth. And these three areas are the cochlea, uh, the vestibule chamber, and the semicircular canals. The cochlea is a, a bony spiral or a snail shell shaped looking structure, which is the entrance to the internal ear. It's connected to the oval window membrane. Now inside the cochlea you'll find a, a fluid called paralymph. Now it's this fluid that will help transmit sound throughout this area. So it's the cochlea that's actually the organ of hearing. So this sound will transmit to another section of the cochlea which has a different type of fluid called the endolymph. Alright, sound is then carried to tiny hair-like receptors that pick up the vibrations of this fluid that's sloshing around. It will convert that into an electrical impulse that travels to the brain via the vestibulocochlear nerve. If these uh, receptors are damaged, they can't be repaired. So people who listen to uh, loud music, especially with uh, earbud headphones, the longer you do this, or the louder you listen to music like this, it will basically paralyze these receptors. And once they're gone, they're gone. And it's, you lose some of their function as we age naturally anyway. So it's natural to lose some frequency of hearing as we get older. But by listening to loud music or working in an environment where you don't have any ear protection, once these hair cells get damaged, then you know, their function can't be brought back. So this can lead to a loss of hearing uh, prematurely. Right, in addition to hearing, the ear is also responsible for a sense of equilibrium or sense of balance. Now inside the inner ear, you have a set of semicircular canals, three semicircular canals that produce or process sensory information in three different planes of motion. You know, forward, back, left, right, up, down. So this is how you're able to move and be able to tell where you are in space due to how fluid is sloshing around these semicircular canals. Now at the base of each of these semicircular canals is an organ that helps uh, interpret information to tell your brain where you are in space. Here's how the, the cochlea looks actually looks like a, a snail's shell and inside it is where you'll find the, the lymph sloshing around and here you have the semicircular canals there's one there's one and there's one at the base of each one you'll find these these structures the ampulla and within these uh, semicircular canals just like we do in, a, in the cochlea there's a fluid that will as you move will be sloshing around within these tubes which will give you the impression of movement for people who suffer from uh, vertigo for example where you feel like you're moving even though you're not it's the same thing when you are on a say a small boat then you get back on land you may feel like you're still on the boat you, you may feel like you are still moving that's because of you are perceiving that you're moving because the fluid is in these canals is still causing these receptors to give you the impression that you're moving even though you're not. If you are drunk the alcohol that you have consumed is impacting these receptors here so it's causing them to move when they shouldn't be moving so you feel like the room is spinning even though it's not. All right, here's a summary of uh, the structures and functions of the various parts of the ear you know, external middle and inner the name of the structure and then their main function so it's a good summary right there of all three. All right, here's a, a summary of the process of hearing. The one, and the sound waves will enter the, the outer ear. It will travel through the auditory canal here. Uh, step two, it will hit the eardrum. Step three, it will vibrate the auditory ossicles in the middle ear, which will lead to step four. That vibration of the ossicles creates pressure waves inside the oval window, causing the fluid in the cochlea to, to impact the uh, hair-like nerve cells, which will lead to five. The vibrations will travel through the cochlear duct, which will go to six. The signal will be interpreted through the uh, auditory nerves. All right, next we'll move on to pathology connection. We'll go to certain diseases of the ear. Uh, the first one, deafness. 
This can be either partial or complete. Uh, some possible causes. Uh, you can have inflammation or scarring on the eardrum itself. There could be damage to the auditory nerve, or there could be brain damage. Uh, external otitis, also called swimmer's ear. This could be caused by uh, a fungal infection or a bacterial infection. Uh, common symptoms, uh, temporary hearing loss, uh, pain, and fever. Also be uh, attracted from uh, swimming in a contaminated pool or, or beaches. This can be prevented by uh, make sure that you are wearing earplugs or by cleaning and drying your ear uh, right after swimming. The next one, otitis media. This is an acute infection of the middle ear you know, caused by either bacteria or a virus. Uh, very common in infants and uh, toddlers. Usually associated with a cold or other uh, respiratory infections, especially the upper respiratory tract. Uh, some symptoms, uh, pain, edema, uh, pus coming out of the ear. Uh, some cases it can perforate the eardrum itself. Uh, some treatment, of course antibiotics. Uh, if this is a recurring condition or chronic in nature, you can have uh, tiny tubes inserted into the tympanic membrane to help relieve the pressure. The sinus infection or sinusitis uh, can also spread to can, can spread and become an ear infection or vice versa. Uh, mastoiditis can potentially lead to brain infections. Labyrinthitis, inflammation of the the labyrinth or the or the inner ear, uh, is caused by an infection. Uh, results usually in vertigo, and the feeling of uh, spinning around in space or just general dizziness. Meniere's disease is a chronic condition that affects uh, the labyrinth or the inner ear and leads to a progressive hearing loss and also uh, vertigo. Autosclerosis this is a chronic uh, progressive middle ear uh, condition where you have excessive bone growth of the ossicles in the middle ear. This is a hereditary disease. It usually affects both ears and usually treated by uh, stependectomy surgery. Basically removal of uh, parts of the stapes. Tinnitus is a ringing or a buzzing or a roaring or a hissing or even clicking noises in your ears. Uh, possible causes, chronic exposure to loud noises, old age hearing loss, uh, stress, depression, uh, so on. Also some medications can lead to tinnitus. Uh, wa a wax buildup, uh, various uh, disturbances to the auditory nerve. And all these can lead to effects on the process of hearing. All right, now move on to other senses. Uh, start with the sense of, sense of taste, also known as the uh, gustatory sense. Uh, the taste buds will be located on the tongue, and they detect uh, five different tastes, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and a new, fairly new taste has been named called umami. It's a savory taste. It's usually found in uh, Asian cuisines. Now the taste preferences will change with the body's needs. A refinement for food is primarily dependent on our sense of smell. If you can't smell properly, then you won't be able to taste properly. This is why when you are uh, sick with a cold or a flu or just congested in general, things taste differently because you aren't able to smell them properly. It's why your voice sounds differently because you were congested with you know, mucus buildup, your voice can't echo through your uh, the sinuses. It will impact how you sound also. The basic illustration of a tongue with some various taste buds scattered throughout. And contrary to what people think, there aren't any regions of the tongue for just salt or just sweet or just sour. These taste buds are scattered throughout the tongue in general. So you may have one taste bud for sweet be right next to one for bitter. So you don't have regions like on the side for one taste, or on the tip for one taste, or in the middle for one taste. All of this, or all the different tastes are scattered all over the tongue. All right, the sense of smell, this will arise from uh, receptors in the olfactory region of the nasal cavity. When we sniff things, what you're doing is bring the, the chemical actually into your nose to be interpreted by the olfactory uh, region. And like I mentioned before, taste and smell are very closely related. Being able to smell Pleasant smells will stimulate digestive enzymes. See, uh, rhinitis, and the prefix uh, rhine or rhino is a reference to nose. And of course, itis is infection. So, rhinitis is the inflammation of the mucous membranes that line the nasal passage, basically characterized by congestion and drainage. And this usually develops in uh, the response to of histamine. So that's why if you are, well, if you have allergies and you are 
easy to get congested, especially in springtime. This is why you take antihistamines to counteract that so you don't get congested. Rhinitis can also be caused by bacterial infections, viral infections, allergies, uh, very strong odors, uh, illegal drugs like cocaine, for example. All right, uh, touch receptors. These will be uh, small, rounded uh, bodies called uh, tactile or corpuscles. They're found in uh, the skin. Uh, very specially concentrated in the tip of the tongue and the fingertips. Temperature sensors that are located in the skin will have separate types of receptors for both heat and for cold. The adaptation. This is a continued sensory stimulation. It causes the uh, sensors to uh, desensitize or adapt. And what that means is, a good way to think about this is whenever you first smell something really, really strong, either really good or really bad, after a while, you don't notice it anymore. That's because the brain can tell the stimuli is still here. There's no need to keep telling you that it smells good or smells bad because it's a waste of your body's energy to keep reminding you of this. So that's why you can be somewhere that would smell really, really bad at first, but then after a few minutes, you don't notice it. The smell hasn't changed, but your perception of that smell has changed. Your body has adapted to that smell. It's the same thing with touch. You don't notice that you're still wearing you know, your socks or your shirt. You are Your body has adapted to that sensation. All right, here are some examples of the sense of touch. The generic touch here, and then you have a tickle with a feather, a sharp pain with a needle, uh, traction with a, with a pinch, uh, heat and cold and pressure. All of these are based on different types of receptors, different types of receptors down here. So depending on what type of touch can be perceived by a different type of receptor. So each individual type of receptor will respond to its own unique type of stimulus. So the receptor for this type of pressure will not detect a light touch like this. See some other senses. Uh, pain obviously is very important as a protective sense. It's a way of our body telling us to avoid danger. So this is a very widely distributed sense throughout the body. Is that You'll find pain receptors or nociceptors as they're formally called you know, throughout the skin. And the muscles and joints and internal organs, branching of nerve fibers that are called the free nerve ending. All right, there are different types of pain. Uh, the first one, referred pain. This originates in an internal organ and is felt in another region of the skin. For example, if you have pain in the gallbladder or the liver, it may be felt in your right shoulder instead. And the same thing as having, when someone has a heart attack, they feel pain radiating down their left arm. Uh, next type is called phantom pain. This is pain that's felt in an area that doesn't exist anymore, such as if you have an amputation. You may feel like you have pain in your left foot, even though the foot isn't attached to you anymore. Here are some common sites of uh, referred pain. Uh, like I mentioned before, the uh, pain for the heart. You may feel the pain radiating down you know, the left shoulder, down all the way down to the left forearm, the gallbladder, or, or liver. You may fear, feel it in the shoulder, the right shoulder. Liver pain, not only here, but also in the, on the right side of the neck, pancreas, and stomach, right here in the middle of the just below the chest all right one thing about uh, pain receptors they don't ever adapt you know like we talked about with the sense of smell where you are smelling something very strong you know, good or bad eventually you don't notice it anymore well that doesn't happen with pain receptors the pain is felt as long as the stimulus is there the only way that you don't feel it is if you're under an anesthetic and there is some debate on whether or not people actually have a higher or lower threshold of pain they may just have more uh, pain receptors or less pain receptors as opposed to a a threshold of what they consider to be painful or not uh, proprioception this is the sense of your body's orientation knowing where you are in space in general uh, some examples you can close your eyes and then raise an arm and know which arm you're raising even without looking at it because you know that's your left arm. You know that's your right arm. You, know, you can close your eyes and touch the, the tips of your nose with your fingers because you know where you are in space relative to everything else. You'll find these uh, receptors found in muscles and joints and in tendons and also the inner ear and they help you perceive uh, equilibrium and maintain equilibrium. Now when you have an excessive stimulation of equilibrium uh, receptors in the inner ear is when you get uh, motion sickness. You feel like you are moving more than you actually are. And now we'll cover some uh, common diseases of the eye. Uh, the first one, astigmatism. Uh, etiology uh, is an alteration of the shape of the cornea itself, where it becomes more uh, football-shaped compared to its spherical shape that it should be. Usually uh, hereditary, but it can be caused due to a, an eye injury. Some common signs, uh, blurred vision, uh, eye strain, headaches. Some diagnostic tests for astigmatism, an eye exam uh, to examine the shape of the cornea. Treatment. Unless it's an extreme example, 
This can be corrected with eyeglasses or contact lenses. If it is an extreme uh, condition, then you have to have refractive eye surgery. Lazy eye, uh, the etiology, eye trauma or a strong refractive error, such as being very strongly nearsighted or very strongly farsighted, generally develop in young children. Uh, some signs, uh, squinting or completely closing one eye uh, to see. Of course, poor vision, uh, eye strain, uh, headaches due to the eye strain. Some diagnostic tests, a personal history of the patient, and of course, an eye exam. Treatments for lazy eye, patching the stronger eye to force the weaker eye to uh, compensate and to function better. So atropine eye drops, and also corrective uh, refractive uh, surgery if needed. Blepharitis, uh, etiology, is the inflammation of the eyelids, usually caused by a bacterial infection. Some common signs of this condition, eye irritation, tearing, uh, dryness, uh, burning sensation, and also a foreign body irritation. A diagnostic test, of course, an eye exam, a history of the patient, of the patient, a way you would treat this condition, uh, warm compresses, antibiotics, artificial tears, steroids if needed, uh, cataracts, uh, etiology, uh, the clouding of the lens, usually caused by uh, proteins uh, clumping together as we gradually get older. The cause is unknown, but excessive UV light exposure is a is a prime suspect of what could lead to cataracts. Uh, people who are diabetic are at a much higher risk to develop cataracts than others, and cataracts will frequently develop in people who are 70 years of age or and older. Common signs, pain, a gradual blurring, and then eventually the loss of vision. The diagnostic test, of course an eye exam uh, treatment uh, in the early stages, glasses or uh, other magnification aids. If the vision becomes seriously impaired, then you have to have surgery to correct the cataract. Uh, color blindness, etiology, is not technically blindness at all, but it's being unable to distinguish between red and green, so there is no real blindness going on. This is caused by the retinal cells to be unable to distinguish between the two colors, red and green. Uh, the cause is usually hereditary. Um, it's much more common in males than in females. And aging and certain diseases can also be uh, a cause for color blindness. Uh, some signs and symptoms. Obviously, the inability to distinguish between red and green or blue and yellow also is another form of color blindness. Diagnostic test, the Ishihara plates that we saw earlier, forming uh, letters or numbers by using colored circles, by using like red and green or blue and yellow. Uh, people who aren't colorblind can see them perfectly fine. Those people who are colorblind, all they see is bubbles. They don't see any difference in color at all. Uh, the way you treat color blindness, uh, there's no cure, but it's very helpful to be for this to be recognized early in the child's life to prevent some developmental issues. And here's another example of the Ishihara charts. For someone who is colorblind, all they see is uh, random circles of no discernible color difference. For people who are not colorblind, you should see the number 27. Number 27 in green. There's a 2 right here. And then the 7 right here. Uh, conjunctivitis, or pink eye. The etiology, the inflammation of the conjunctiva, the membrane lines the eye. Inflammation caused by a bacteria or a virus or certain allergies. Some signs, having a, a pinkish colored eye. Uh, it could be a discharge, it could be uh, itching, it could be pain, uh, excessive eye watering. Uh, some diagnostic tests, uh, the eye exam, uh, taking a culture, and also some uh, sensitivity uh, test. Uh, treatment for a pink eye, of course avoiding the cause of the infection. Uh, warm compresses, eye drops for the bacterial infections, uh, and histamines for the allergic forms. Uh, diabetic ret retinopathy, etiology, uh, very high blood sugar will damage the blood vessels in the eye. So in the later stages, can, you can have uh, new blood vessel growth over the retina, which will cause scarring. This will cause the retina to become detached. So if untreated, it can lead to blindness. Uh, some signs and symptoms, uh, seeing floaters in your field of vision. Now, having floaters in general is not that big a deal. It is fairly common, but when they become when they become excessive, that's when it is potentially a serious problem. Uh, having double vision, uh, swelling, uh, fluid leakage, all that could be signs of uh, diabetic retinopathy. Some diagnostic tests: fluorescein angiography. A contrast dye is injected into uh, the blood flow in the retina, so you can see which vessels, if any, are obstructed and if the retina is becoming detached or not. Uh, treatment: laser photocoagulation to seal off the blood vessels that are leaking and destroy the new growth. Uh, some drugs that are helpful in some of the early stages and can also be controlled mostly by uh, controlling the blood sugar levels. Uh, dry eye syndrome, 
Uh, ideology is a chronic lack of uh, lubrication in the eye. This is due to a lack of tear production. can be a part of the natural aging process or side effects of medications or climate related. You know, if you live in a very dry, arid area or a, w a very windy area or if you are a long-term user of contact lenses, a lack of blinking or certain diseases can lead to a dry eye syndrome. Uh, it's much more common for uh, women than men. And if you are a smoker, this will increase uh, your risk to developing dry eye syndrome. Uh, some common signs and symptoms, of course, dryness, uh, scratchiness, uh, burning in the eye. Uh, some diagnostic tests, of course, the eye exam and the personal history. Uh, treatments, first of all, avoid the irritating cause. When prevention or cure isn't possible, uh, you can use artificial tears, which are basically just lubricating eye drops. This will help alleviate some of the dryness, some of the burning, some of the itchiness. Here's an example of a conjunctivitis or pink eye. You can see the reddish color here. Not so much on this side, but definitely on this side. All right, in this image, uh, this woman has a cataract in her right eye. You see how it's much more cloudy than it should be because the lens is becoming uh, fogged over. You compare that to this side, which is perfectly fine. So if that is corrected quickly, it will become so cloudy, it will become completely opaque and she'll be completely blind. All right, here's a sty, inflammation of a eyelash right here at the base of the eyelid, so it's affecting the entire eyelid itself. All right, now move on to common diseases of the ear. Uh, the first one, external otitis, or swimmer's ear. Uh, etiology, commonly caused by infections of uh, co contaminated water, such as bacteria or, or fungus. Right, some common signs and symptoms, uh, pain, fever, hearing loss that is temporary. Common diagnostic test would be visual ear exam. And the best treatment, cleaning and drying the external ear right after swimming, and also by wearing earplugs. Otitis media, uh, etiology is an acute infection of the middle ear, caused by a bacteria or a virus, usually associated with a, uh, a cold or a, a URI, an upper respiratory tract infection. Common signs, symptoms, uh, pain, edema, pus. If left untreated, it can actually uh, perforate the eardrum, the tympanic membrane. And this has the potential for the, an invasion of the nearby uh, mastoid process, which is an extension of the, of the skull uh, right near the jaw, which can lead to mastoiditis. Diagnostic test, you know, otoscopic examination. Treatment, obviously treating the underlying infection, whether it be viral or you know, bacterial. Of course, antibiotics if it's in a bacterial source. Labyrinthitis, uh, etiology, inflammation of the inner ear, or the labyrinth, usually caused by an infection. Some common signs and symptoms, uh, vertigo, or feel like you're whirling around in space. Some diagnostic tests, uh, patient history, uh, radiologic studies, uh, some treatments. Anti-vertigo uh, class drugs, such as Benadryl, have been successful. Uh, Meniere's disease, uh, etiology uh, is, a, is a chronic condition that affects uh, the inner ear, the labyrinth. Uh, some common signs, uh, it's a progressive hearing loss, uh, tinnitus, and also vertigo. Some diagnostic tests, uh, patient history, audiologic and radiologic exams, uh, some treatments, uh, a particular type of diuretic that will help dry out the labyrinth, and also uh, decreasing the amount of caffeine that you drink. Tinnitus, uh, etiology, can occur as a result of exposure to loud noises or Meniere's disease, uh, some medications, a buildup of wax, or any kind of disturbance of the auditory nerve in general. Common signs, a ringing or clicking or, or hissing noise in your ears. Diagnostic tests, you know, personal history, best treatment is to eliminate the loud noises. All right, now move on to the uh, pharmacology quarter. Uh, drugs that affect uh, the eyes. Right, midriatic agents, these will dilate the pupils. An example, atropine. This is used especially when you go to an optometrist to examine the inner parts of the eye. As the after the exam, you'll need to wear a protective film over your eyes because your pupils will be so dilated. Even sunlight on a cloudy day can be very, very uncomfortable, very painful because the pupils are so dilated. So you have to give it time for the drug to wear off. Myotic agents, these will constrict the pupils. For example, uh, narcotics. And sometimes the constriction is so tight, pupils will look like the points of a pin. Uh, topical antibiotics, uh, drops and salves. These are used for eye infections. For ear medications, uh, topical antibiotics. These are used for infections. Uh, topical anesthetics. These can be used for very severe ear pain. Uh, some drugs for motion sickness. Uh, antiverts, this will affect... Uh, neural pathways that originate in labyrinth. This will inhibit the nausea and vomiting caused by motion sickness. And these drugs will limit how much your brain perceives you as moving. And that brings us to the end of uh, chapter number 11. And we will continue this course with our next video covering chapter number 12.